That working okay? You can hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming out today. I love venues where I can wear shorts. This is great, especially when everybody else is in shorts and casual. I fit right in. Very nice. I don't want to be all stuffy with a coat and tie, but occasionally I have to put one on. Um, I do lecture around the world uh, internationally, everything from local rotary clubs and schools to presidential libraries and everything in between. So if you like tonight's presentation, I'll take credit. If you don't like it, we'll blame Rich. <laughs> but uh, Rich and I uh, have known each other just a few months now. Uh, Mark Gillies is my fraternity brother from college, which is his son-in-law, and uh, that's how we made the connection. So I want to thank Mark for inviting me up here. I want to thank Rich for inviting me up here for you to come out and spend an hour with me to talk about Cold War history. So we'll be talking about the U-2 incident, my father, Gary Powers, um, the truth of what took place. To start, I want to reference a movie that some of you may have seen, Bridge of Spies. Has anybody seen that movie? All right, uh, one more time, who's seen it? Oh, less than, okay, you can do a movie night. Um, it came out in 2014. It stars Tom Hanks as James Donovan. James Donovan is the attorney who brokered the exchange between my father and Soviet spy Rudolf Abel in 1962. He's also the attorney who um, represented the Soviet spy Rudolf Abel at his trial after his capture in the 50s. When I first found out that Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks were going to do a movie that would portray my father, I'm thinking at first, they're not going to do this. Why would they do this? They have no reason to do this. But then in July of 2014, I get confirmation through the Hollywood Reporter, some other trade magazines, that they're going to do this movie that will portray my father. My first thoughts, how do you get in touch with Steven Spielberg? You just can't pick up the phone. He's a very busy man. Everybody wants a piece of him. So I reach out to some friends in California. That's where I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, some of my friends in high school were actors or their parents were actors. So I reached out to them, tried to get an introduction. Could not. So I resort to Google. I type in Spielberg's name type in his movies, find people he worked with, I type in their names. And I'm able to find about five or six of their email addresses. So I send out this unsolicited email to about five or six of Spielberg's uh, associates, and I basically say the following. Hello, my name's Gary Powers Jr. I'd like to talk to Mr. Spielberg about this movie that will portray my dad. It's very important that we express the Powers family's concerns. If he bases the portrayal of dad off the misinformation, the fake news of the time, they'll be painting him in a negative light. If they base it off the declassified information that's come to surface the last 50 plus years, they'll be painting him as a hero to our country. So for obvious reasons, wanted to reach out, try to establish contact. As a result of that email, I get a phone call from the producer, Mark Platt. Mark Platt is better known for his production of Wicked on Broadway. So very well regarded, very well respected within the industry. Mark and I talk for about an hour in July of 2014. At the end of the conversation, hey, Mr. Powers, thank you so much for reaching out to us. You're very knowledgeable on the Cold War, the U2 incident, what your father went through. How would you like to consult for the film? Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be great. Thank you very much. Can I get 1% of the proceeds? No. <laughs> but they did treat me very nice, uh, wined me and dined me, took me up to, San, uh, to New York for one of the scenes, took me to Beale Air Force Base for the flying and the pilot sequence scenes. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to work with Spielberg, Hanks, the crew, the staff, everybody that was on the movie. Now, um, when I get this contract to review and then sign to be a consultant. I'm going through it. At first, it's boilerplate right off the shelf. I'm to answer questions. I'm to provide photographs of my family from the 50s. They can Photoshop, put their actors' heads on. I'm to provide audio tapes of my father talking so that they can listen to him in his own voice talking about his experiences. That way they can hear in his own words what he had gone through. The very end of this contract, the last paragraph, it basically says, they don't have to listen to me. Hmm. Very last sentence, if I don't like the film, 
tough. No, I can't sue, there's no recourse. So I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, they're gonna tie my hands, they're gonna use the family's name, and then they're gonna do whatever they wanna do. So I thought long and hard what I should do. At the end of the day, I did sign the dotted line. I thought it was more important to be a part of the production, try to steer them in the right direction. Had I walked away, I would have had no say whatsoever. So I am very glad that I did sign the contract. I liked the movie. The big picture is historically accurate. It accurately portrays the time period of the Cold War, the duck and cover drills that some of you probably did as kids, uh, the fears and tensions between the Soviets and the Americans, the fear of a nuclear war between our two countries, all very accurately portrayed in the movie. The big picture. But you have to remember, this is Hollywood. They use dramatic effect, they take artistic liberties, uh, they do embellishing. Spielberg, the writers, have to take eight years of time and condense it into two hours and 15 minutes. So as a result, they have to take some leeway and a little uh, uh, back and forth to make everything fit according to what they want the audience to see. As a result, uh, there is some misinformation in the movie. Uh, the misinformation was circulating back in the 1960s. So it's accurate for the time period, but it's not historically accurate as to what happened with my father, the cause of the shoot downs and things like that. Now, the movie is based off of two books, Strangers on a Bridge by James Donovan. James Donovan is the attorney who represented the Soviet spy and brokered the exchange. Uh, he writes this book in 1965 based on his notes, uh, his memory, uh, representing the spy and brokering the exchange. It's also based off of my dad's autobiography, Operation Overflight. This book came out in 1970. Dad wrote it with the information he had available at the time. In 1970, things were still classified, middle of the Cold War. He could not put everything in that he wanted, but he was able to get his story out for public consumption. So between these two books and the fake news of the time, you've got the movie Breed of Spies. So we're gonna show a quick two and a half minute video clip, um, uh, the preview, to kind of set the stage for today's talk. All right. You've been selected for a mission which you are not to discuss with anyone outside of this room. We are engaged in a war with the Soviet Union. This war does not for the moment involve men in arms. It involves information. has come up. We've got the Soviet spot. spot. But there's a ring. A spy pilot? Or the head full of classified information? The Russians want their man back. Break the cracks. They want you to negotiate the swap. I'm an insurance lawyer. I'm not sure I want to pick that up. Are you good at what you do? This will be a first for the both of us. You should be careful. I'm talking to you about the security of your country. Why aren't we hanging him? He's a spy! You're asking me to violate the Constitution. Do you know how people will look at us? The family of a man trying to free a traitor? Everyone deserves a defense. Every person matters. Where do they want this negotiation? East Berlin. Just tell me that you're not going to be in any danger. I don't even care if it's the truth. Give me something to hold on to. We need to have the conversation our governments can't. People in my country consider this an act of war. You can call it what you want. Let's be clear. Nobody is safe. We're in a battle for civilization. The Constitution is what makes us Americans. Shouldn't we show our enemy who we are? Things have started to fall apart. Is this your position or your government's? Is there any outcome here where I'm not either detained or shot? Do we need to worry about you? No. What's the move when you don't know what the game is? The next mistake our countries make could be the last one.
So the movie came out in uh, 2015. You can find DVD or Blu-ray copies off of eBay, or you can find occasionally it'll be showing on Netflix and Showtime and maybe even a YouTube channel. I'm gonna show one other qu uh, short clip. This is a behind the scenes uh, clip from the movie. Uh, on this clip, you'll see the Glenacre Bridge. It's where the spy exchange took place in real life and in the movie. So that is historically accurate, the location for the bridge. Uh, you'll see Spielberg talking to his cast and crew, getting ready to film the scene. Gives you a little behind the scenes look as to how Spielberg puts this scene together. For me, it was super powerful to be standing on the bridge, the Gleenacre Bridge. It says the Bridge of Spies as you walk up onto that bridge. And it was freezing cold. Cold. The bridge was freezing. It was. But uh, we were all in it together. And that was our last bit in Berlin. And what a way to go out. I, I wouldn't do the, the dialogue on the walk. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do the long dialogue on a side dialogue. Okay. We all reacted to it. I don't think there was a single actor there or a member of the crew that weren't taking into account the fact that this is where incredible history happened and it had global, international repercussions. And to be there recreating it raises the stakes of what we're doing. We're gonna push it on a nice medium shot of, of Abel's reaction to seeing Donovan. And then we're gonna dolly back with Abel and then turn into this configuration. Have you arranged all this for me? Well, let's see what this is before I, I take credit for it. Second to queue up. Okay. So, um, as a little background for myself uh, before I start the formal presentation, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, uh, did my undergraduate degree at uh, Cal State Los Angeles, moved out to Virginia in 1992 to do my master's degree in public administration, nonprofit management from George Mason University. And my career for 20 plus years was in nonprofit management. Who here has heard of Tyson's Corner, Virginia? Okay, great. Um, I helped to create the Tyson's Corner Chamber of Commerce. I ran the Vienna Tyson's Corner Chamber of Commerce for five years between 2000 and 2005. While I'm doing that between 1996 uh, uh, and 2011, I am also creating the Cold War Museum to honor Cold War veterans, preserve Cold War history, educate kids on this time period. What I thought would take three years to develop, three years to fundraise $3 million, shouldn't be too hard to do, took 15 years to get brick and mortar. We are located at Vint Hill, 45 miles west of Washington, D.C. Uh, we're opened on the weekends, staffed by volunteers. Uh, more information online at coldwar.org. So it was my idea to create the museum. I fundraised enough money to draw a salary for five years, opened it in 2011. Then I took a back seat. I didn't want a, it to be known as the Gary Powers Museum. It had to stand on its own two feet, which it's done successfully now the last 12 years. So very happy to have that online, coldwar.org, and in person at Vint Hill Farm Station. Now, when I'm growing up in Southern California, I'm aware that my father was shot down over the former Soviet Union, imprisoned by the KGB, ultimately exchanged for a Soviet spy. But as a kid, growing up in this family, this was normal. I was aware of it, we talked about it. My perception as a young kid is that everybody's dad went through something like this. That perception changed August 1st, 1977. Dad dies in a helicopter crash while working for NBC television out of Los Angeles. I am 12 years old at the time. I come home to a house full of people who inform my mom and I of the bad news. Lives are turned upside down. I become very introverted throughout high school. I don't understand why the press will call the house to ask questions, why friends at school would come up and tell me something they knew about my dad. All of a sudden, these peers at school would know something about me and my family but I wouldn't know anything about them or their family. So it was a little bit of an adjustment that I was going through after the loss of my dad. In college, I came out of my shell. I was curious, wanted to find out more about my father. Why was there conspiracy theories about him? Why was he controversial? 
More importantly, I wanted to find out what was the truth of what took place. In high school and, and growing up, people would say, oh, Gary Powers' kid, why'd your dad do this? Why didn't he do that? Well, originally, I didn't know the answers, so I didn't want to talk about it. But then in college, I started doing this research. And in the library, I uncovered that dad's on the cover of Time magazine in May of 1960 as a result of being shot down. So here I am, 20 years old in college, and for the first time realizing that dad was on the cover of Time. So it kind of sparked uh, curiosity. What other magazines was he on? What other books wrote about him? What was the truth of what took place? So I started doing this research. Dad was born August 17, 1929, Southwest Virginia. He's one of six children, the second oldest. He has five sisters. His dad is a coal miner, works in the coal fields in Pound, Virginia, Wise, Norton, Big Stone Gap, right on the Kentucky, uh, close to the West Virginia border. And um, he's grown up in this family on the family farm. During the Depression, the Great Depression, 1929 to 1939, 1940, he's growing up. At one point in time, he tells me a story that he's lying in bed, listening to his parents speak in the next room. They're not talking about where the next dollar will come from. They're talking about where the next nickel will come from, the height of the Depression. So this is what dad's being raised in uh, in his early life. Um, in about 1939, 1940, he gets a ride in a Piper Cub by a female pilot at a country fair in Princeton, West Virginia. After the 20 minute flight, he lands, he tells his family, I've left my heart up there. He knows he wants to be a pilot. This is what he's gonna be pursuing now going forward. He is the first of his family to go to college. He goes to college in Milligan College in Tennessee, graduates in 1950, immediately enlists in the US Air Force. He wants to be a pilot. He's following his passion, his dream. After two years of training, he gets his wings in 1952. He is flying F-84s out of Turner Air Force Base near Albany, Georgia. There between 52 and 56, he's training to fly the plane. Uh, he's about to go over to the Korean Peninsula. Sometime in late 1955 or early 1956, my dad has an appendicitis. It lays him up in the hospital. He misses his deployment over to Korea. As a result, a few months go by. He finds his name on a duty roster to report to the commanding officer. There's some gentlemen out of Washington, D.C. that are looking for certain pilots to talk to them about career opportunities. And this is a little confusing to my dad. He's been in the Air Force for six years. He's got 14 more years to go until he can retire. What possible opportunities are there? So curiosity gets the best of him. He goes over to this meeting. Two guys in suits are there from the CIA. They tell the pilots that they're looking for certain qualifications, single jet engine, a uh, certain level of intelligence, patriotic, uh, good background checks. They'll be doing reconnaissance missions in the European theater. They can't tell them at the time, the first meeting, what plane they'll be flying or what exactly they'll be doing, only that it's very dangerous, very patriotic, you'll be flying in the European theater, and once you sign on the dotted line, we can fill you in on the details. Oh, and oh, by the way, your salary will be doubled or tripled the Air Force salary. Hazard duty pay, overseas duty pay, things like that. So my father goes home, talks to his first wife, Barbara, wants to find out, and they discuss this opportunity. They both agree that this opportunity will allow him to advance his career. He goes back to the next meeting. He signs the non-disclosure agreement. That's when the guys in suits will tell the pilots, you'll be flying over foreign hostile countries, taking photographs 70,000 feet and above in a U-2. It's a specially designed aircraft by Lockheed Aircraft Corporation to fly above 70,000 feet out of the reach of the Soviet SA-1 missiles. So my father is very excited about this opportunity. Uh, he uh, resigns from the Air Force, takes on a civilian capacity. He's trained to fly the U-2 at Area 51 in the Nevada desert. After about two months of training, he shipped over to Intralik Air Force Base near Adana, Turkey. This is his flight squadron, his U-2 squadron uh, in Turkey. Um, Dad is in the back row on the far left. 
So dad, between 1956 and 1960, flies 27 successful missions. Some of these missions are over the Soviet Union, other missions are over China, Tibet, India, Pakistan, uh, Middle Eastern countries, Eastern European countries, taking photographs, gathering intelligence, finding out the strengths and weaknesses of our adversaries. So after four years of successful flights, my dad is one of the pilots with the most number of hours in the plane, the most experienced flying the aircraft. He is selected for the May 1st, 1960 mission. This mission will take off from Peshawar, Pakistan. It'll fly some 3,000 miles north, should land in Boda, Norway. Should take about nine hours to fly. My father wakes up very early on May 1st, gets into his uh, pressure suit, goes to his briefing, finds out what targets to overfly, all the while he's breathing pure oxygen. The reason that the pilots will breathe pure oxygen for the first hour before their flight is to get the nitrogen bubbles out of the bloodstream, out of the muscles. The bends, uh, people who scuba dive can get the bends if they go down too deep, come up too quickly, nitrogen bubbles. Same thing happens to uh, pilots who fly at extreme altitudes. They want to make sure that they minimize the risk by getting the nitrogen bubbles out of the bloodstream. So he goes through his pre-breathing, he goes through his briefing, then at 9 a.m. he takes off. He crosses over the Soviet's border at approximately 68,000 feet. He starts to flip on and off the camera switches that will take the photographic imagery of the ground below. He is four hours into his mission. He's at an altitude of 70,500 feet over the city of Sverdlovsk. At that location, there's a bright orange flash. A shockwave hits the plane, pushes the plane forward, throws my father back in his seat. The plane has been hit by the near miss of a Soviet SA-2 missile, one of eight missiles fired at the aircraft uh, that he was flying on May 1st. As a result of the explosion, the tail section is damaged. You can't fly a plane without a tail section. My father's in the cockpit, realizes that the controls no longer respond. Once uh, he realizes something's gone wrong, the nose pitches forward, the wings snap off, the plane goes into an inverted spin, tumbling out of the sky. Dad is in the cockpit, hanging upside down, strapped in by his harness. Uh, he's about to hit the destruct button, but he realizes that he only has 60 seconds to get out of the airplane. If he hits the button and can't get out of the plane, well, that's not a good scenario. So he's trying to get his legs back in the proper position. He cannot get his legs back in. The centrifugal force, the spinning of the aircraft, he just can't get in the proper position to eject. If he ejects in the position he's in, he will sever his legs on the way out. Realizing this, my dad start, uh, uh, does the following. He starts to panic. He forces himself to maintain composure, take a deep breath, relax, think of another way out. Oh, I can crawl out. Immediately he undoes the canopy which floats off into space. He undoes his harness and is sucked up halfway out of the cockpit. He is still connected by his air hose, two or three feet of air hose, being banged around. Uh, he can no longer reach the destruct button. He can no longer see it. His face plates frosted over. He doesn't know how high he is. He doesn't know how quickly he's getting to the ground. He can't see out past his nose. All he knows is that the plane's falling and he has to get out of the plane. He's able to break free of the air hose, falls free of the airplane, his parachute opens automatically at 15,000 feet, and he parachutes down to the ground. On the way down, he notices a dark car following his descent. Once he lands on the outskirts of a collective farm, the farmers working the fields rush up to him, help him with his backpack, his parachute, his helmet, start to ask him questions in Russian. They think he's one of theirs. Well, dad doesn't speak Russian, shrugs his shoulders, makes one of the farmers a little nervous. Who is this guy, falls out of the sky, doesn't speak our language. About that time, a black car shows up, two men get out, put him in the back seat, and they take him to the local officials in town. There, someone speaks broken English, basically asking them a few questions. Who are you? What are you doing here? Where'd you come from? To which dad would reply, 
My name is Gary Powers. I am lost. I had a mechanical malfunction. Can you take me to the American Embassy? No, yet, that is not allowed. Can you take me to the American Red Cross? No, that is not allowed. And so this is how it went the first few hours of his capture. Later that afternoon, early evening, KGB guards show up from Moscow, take him by armed guard and airplane to Moscow's airport, shuttle him over by car to Lubyanka prison. Lubyanka is the infamous KGB prison, part of and adjacent to the KGB headquarters in downtown Moscow. So this is where my father finds himself his first night of captivity on May 1st of 60. For the next five days, the Soviets say nothing about the shootdown. But back at home uh, in Washington, um, President Eisenhower, Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, they are meeting with State Department and Air Force officials. They're trying to figure out where's the plane, where's the pilot, why didn't he land in Boda, Norway? But no information is available. They don't know what's going on. They haven't heard anything. On or about May 7th, Khrushchev comes up to center stage. He releases this photograph of the U-2 wreckage. He claims uh, in the press conference that they've shot down an American spy plane. But Khrushchev intentionally makes no reference as to the pilot's fate. As a result, the Eisenhower administration, thinking that the pilot had died in the crash, or certainly they would have paraded him around as evidence, they come up with a cover story that an unarmed weather research plane may have accidentally strayed across the border after the pilot had radioed trouble with his oxygen equipment. Once that cover story was in place, a few days go by, Khrushchev comes back up to center stage, a press conference. Ah, comrades, not only did we shoot down the plane, but we also have captured the pilot, Francis Gary Powers, who's quite alive and kicking, and it was confessed to spying for the CIA. So I've got to take you back 63 years now. In 1960, very few people were aware of the CIA. Top secret, government agency, created in 1947 as part of the National Security Act to safeguard Americans at home by gathering intelligence from abroad. So it was a very big embarrassment for Eisenhower to have to admit we had a spy agency and that we've been flying over these foreign hostile countries the last four years. Eisenhower was a World War II general, a Supreme Allied commander, a very well-respected president, very well-respected individual. This is now a blemish on his presidency. He's the first president to get caught lying to the American, uh, to the world public. But now, after 63 years, we know that presidents can and do lie. But in 1960, it was the first time that one had been caught. So international headlines around the world. Uh, U2 shot down, summit conference in jeopardy, Eisenhower caught in a line or embellishing. So this is what's going on after uh, it's released that dad is alive and in captivity. A couple of the press uh, uh, headlines that were released at the time, talking about the Soviets down in an American plane and that Khrushchev is uh, seeing the summit blow. Another one of Khrushchev holding up gold coins. The U-2 pilots that the CIA had were given gold coins, gold watches, gold rings, rubles, American dollars, some other currencies, so that they could barter or bribe their way out of a situation should they be near a border. But dad's 1,300 miles within the Soviet Union, no, nowhere near a border. He can't use that type of stuff to get away. The Soviets release a couple of photographs of my father in captivity. So they make him put back on his helmet, his flight suit, uh, do this photo. You can tell by dad's expression, he is not happy in this photo. He knows it's going to be used for propaganda reasons. Another photo that was released in his overalls, basically showing the world that he's alive and well in captivity. So while all this is transpiring, the press releases are going out, the newspaper articles are being written, uh, the first week before the news breaks, dad is in the Soviet prison uh, in Lubyanka, going through the interrogations. Nine hour days, 12 hour days, bright spotlight, grueling questions, threats of death, no physical torture. I was told by a retired KGB officer some 20 years ago that the reason dad was not tortured is that he was too high profile an individual. The world knew that the Soviets had captured Gary Powers. The Soviets wanted to show the world how nice they were, how humble they were, 
how they treated the spies that they caught in their country. They're using it for propaganda reasons to further embarrass the United States, make them look better. So this is the um, time um, in 1960 when this is going on. So dad's in the cell, he's going through the interrogations. Uh, the first seven days, he's lying to his captors outright, holding back as much information as possible, trying to mislead them any way he can. But on May 7th, May 10th, international headlines around the world start to appear. Uh, the KGB guard in charge of the interrogations on or about May 10th rushes into the interrogation chamber, copy of the New York Times in his hands, shoves it in, the, uh, in uh, my dad's face, yells at him, you've lied to us. You told us you were trained in Arizona. Well, the New York Times says you were trained in Nevada at Area 51. You might as well tell us everything. We'll get it out of your American press anyways. So, dad is stuck between a rock and a hard place. If he tells the full truth, he's giving away secrets. If he lies to him and gets caught, he can get shot, face the death penalty for espionage. So for the next three months of solitary confinement, interrogation, my dad does the following. He tells the full truth when he knows they can verify the information in the press, gives him credibility. He lies to him outright when he knows there's no way they can find out the answers. Names of pilots, number of missions, specifications about the equipment on board. Then he gives a part truth, a part lie, dances around the question when he knows that they know something about the question they're asking, but not enough to contradict his answer, such as the altitude he was flying. My father always maintained throughout the interrogations, the trial, even at home, that he was at the maximum altitude of 68,000 feet when he was shot down. And he used that figure for two reasons. First, close enough to be believable, yet far enough away to keep other planes, other pilots out of harm's way. U-2s would fly between 70,000 and 75,000 feet on operational missions. My father wanted to convince the Soviets to explode their weapons at 68,000 feet, the maximum altitude, thereby creating a 2,000 to 7,000 foot buffer between where the planes would fly and where the missiles would explode. Um, the other reason, he wanted to get the message back home to his employer, the CIA. Hey guys, I'm not telling the full truth and this was eventually discovered when it was brought back home and debriefed. So um, during the first two weeks of this uh, incident, um, Khrushchev is very upset. Uh, he is um, um, thinking that Eisenhower has basically stabbed him in the back. Um, Khrushchev had been over to America in 1959, a guest of the Eisenhowers. The Eisenhowers were supposed to go over to Russia in the fall of 60. That trip was canceled because of the U-2 incident. Uh, the Paris Summit Conference was planned for May 16th of that year. Some people think it was canceled. Well, it wasn't canceled, it fell apart. Khrushchev shows up, de Gaulle, the British Prime Minister, Eisenhower, they go into the conference room. Khrushchev stands up, demands an Eisenhower apology and a stop to the U-2 flights. While Eisenhower does stop the flights of the U-2 program over the Soviet Union, he does not apologize to Khrushchev at the conference. Khrushchev stands up, belittles the president, storms out of the conference, it falls apart, it looks like the Cold War is heating up. And this is all going on the first two weeks of May 1960. So my father all this time is in the jail going through the interrogations for three months. Um, during that time, um, he is uh, trying to keep back as much information as possible, uh, trying to cooperate when he knows he can, trying to hold back as much information when he knows he can. After three months, he's put on trial, show trial, the Hall of Columns, downtown Moscow, international audience. My father's in the docket standing up on the right side. His defense counsel is in front of him. Three judges in the middle that are reviewing the case, the prosecutor on the left-hand side of the stage. After three days, August 17th to August 20th, 1960, uh, my father is sentenced to 10 years in prison. This is him sitting in the docket waiting to hear the sentence. I want to point out that the defense counsel in the glasses on the left side of the screen, not once during my dad's trial did he object to any question asked. 
in the Soviet Union, you are guilty until proven innocent. Unlike here, we are innocent until proven guilty. The switch of those two words makes all the difference in a democratic versus a communist uh, culture. I believe that the prosecutor, the uh, defense, the judges, the state were all in agreement that my father would receive 10 years in prison. He would not get the death sentence. Another propaganda ploy. They wanted to embarrass the United States. The US had executed the Rosenbergs. They'd given Rudolf Abel, a Soviet spy captured in New York City in the 50s, a 30-year prison sentence. But the Soviets give my dad 10 years to show the world how nice, how humble, how good a country they are, to one-up the Americans. This is a press uh, a headline from the New York Times, August 20th, 1960. On the right side, Powers gets a 10-year sentence. On the left side, space capsule is caught in midair by US uh, plane on re-entry from orbit. The Americans are boasting and bragging about their technological advances. We can capture a payload from outer space. We are ahead of the space race. The Soviets can't do this. We're better than them. We're ahead of them. What the New York Times doesn't report and what the US government doesn't say is what the payload is. The first successful film canister from a spy satellite, Corona, jettisoned from outer space, picked up by an airplane, reeled in, taken to Washington, DC, developed, analyzed. That one mission of the Corona spy satellite film uh, photographed more Soviet territory, that one mission, than all previous U-2 flights combined. So the Soviets, uh, the Americans are now aware of what's going on. They have these eyes in the sky. They're able to get information out of the Soviet Union without the use of a U-2 spy plane. I find it very interesting that this headline, not doctored, actual headline, dad on one side, corona spy satellite on the other. The Americans were only down for about four months without getting activity, film, cameras, photos from the Soviets. The last mission of the U-2 that was successful was in April, then the corona spy satellite in August, and then from that moment on, spy satellites were going around the world. So my father is sentenced to 10 years in prison. He starts to serve that sentence in Vladimir. Vladimir prison is three hours outside of Moscow. At that facility, he has a cellmate, Zergard Krimish. He's a Latvian. He tells my dad that he was caught smuggling goods and people in and out of Latvia while working for the British. My dad, Zergard, they get along, they form a friendship, they help each other endure the hardship. Now, Zergard's a brilliant guy. He speaks five or six languages fluently. He is a grand master at chess. Teaches dad to play chess in the Soviet prison, something to pass the time. Once dad, after about two or three weeks, can play chess, he knows how to set up the board, move the pieces, a little strategy, Zergard does the following. He sets up the board, he turns around, he blindfolds himself, and he still beats dad at chess. Brilliant guy. My dad's thinking, wow, this guy is really smart. I bet he can remember everything I say. I think he could be a plant. And circumstantial evidence, we, he probably was a plant. Uh, he was working for the British. He got caught, copped a deal with the Soviets for a lighter sentence for special privileges, um, and then to squeal to, to spy on other prisoners. No official evidence I've ever found, but it makes sense, and circumstantially, I, I think that's what happened. But regardless, they get along, they're friends, they help each other while incarcerated. My father spends a total of 21 months in captivity. Three months solitary confinement in Lubyanka, 18 months in Vladimir. Then he's exchanged for Colonel Rudolf Abel at the Glenacher Bridge in Potsdam, Germany, uh, February 10th of 1962. Abel was caught in New York City in the mid-50s. Uh, he was a master spy, cloak and dagger, trained with microfilm, microfish, uh, secret messages, hollowed out coins, hollowed out pencils, true spy paraphernalia. Um, he gets caught by the FBI. He's sentenced to 30 years in prison in, I think, 1958. And he's serving that sentence when my father is shot down. And then James Donovan, the attorney, brokers the exchange. The exchange takes place at the Glenacher Bridge in Potsdam, Germany. It's a cold, dark, foggy morning, right out of a John Le Carré novel. Two spies on each side of the Glenacher Bridge separates east and west. 
This is a very famous sign on the right-hand side in four different languages. You are leaving the American sector. Across that bridge, East Germany, communism. Uh, here is a political cartoon of the time. Powers on one side, surrounded by the KGB. Abel on the other side, surrounded by the CIA and FBI. The tagline that you can't see at the bottom says, peace through trade. And then one other photo uh, looking west to east. Google says this is the spy exchange. It is not. It was taken the same day as the spy exchange, but it's not the spy exchange. Uh, Dad's exchange with Abel took place at 9 a.m. in the morning. This photo was taken in the afternoon after the news broke. Curiosity seekers, looky-loos, ooh, hey, let's go look at the bridge. So that's when this photo was taken. My dad returns home, uh, the Rudolf Abel returns home, a hero of the Soviet Union, parade in his honor, postage stamp in his likeness, some medals for his heroics. Dad returns home to controversy. While he's in prison, editorials, articles in the newspapers and magazines were being written, saying that he defected, he landed the plane intact, he spilled his guts and told the Soviets everything, or that he didn't follow orders and commit suicide all of which were part truths, mistruths, some innuendos at the time. Uh, it is true that the CIA U-2 pilots were given the option of taking a quote-unquote suicide device with them on missions. It was explained to them that if you're caught, you will be tortured. Here is a way to alleviate the pain and suffering. A small poison-tipped needle hidden in a silver dollar worn around your neck is a good luck charm. Um, it was uh, told, uh, the pilots were told, it's optional to take, optional to use at your discretion in the event of torture, not in the event of capture. When my father has this device on him, Khrushchev comes up, says, oh, look at these evil Americans. This is what they give their spy pilots to commit suicide with. This one wanted to live to see another day. And from that moment on, dad had disobeyed orders. But again, there were no orders to take it, no orders to use it. It was at the pilot's discretion. The exact orders, and I got a paraphrase, is if capture appears eminent, pilots should take a cooperative attitude toward their captors. They're free to tell them about their missions of taking photographs. They should not talk about the equipment on board the airplane or the specifications of the uh, characteristics of the plane. My father followed his orders to a T. When he gets home, He's able to see his mom and dad for the first time in about uh, two years. Uh, Ida Powers on the left, Oliver Powers on the right. After three weeks of debriefing by the CIA at a safe house in Maryland, they realized dad did everything he was supposed to do. There was no flame out, there was no descent, there was no sabotage. It was one of eight SA-2 missiles that exploded behind the tail section that brought down the aircraft. The CIA clears them. He's then put before a Senate Select Committee hearing. The senators, two hours of questions and answers back and forth. At the end of the session, he's exonerated of any wrongdoing. So he's just been exonerated by the Senate, he's been cleared by the CIA, but because of the fake news of the time, he's not yet been cleared by the court of public opinion. His reputation is tarnished going forward. Uh, some people think he's less than a hero, some people think he should have killed himself, some people think he landed or defected. It was all uh, in the news media at the time, and you can still find those reports online through Google where everything is true. Hence why I wanted to write my book, Spy Pilot, basically this lecture, to set the record straight, to tell the truth of what took place. So Dad um, is now working for the CIA for one more year between 62 and 63. He's training agents on what to do if captured, how to go through an interrogation, how to appear to cooperate, when in fact you're not giving the enemy any information of value. But dad, first and foremost, he's a pilot. He wants to fly. He's been cooped up in jail for two years. A desk job for six months. A little stir crazy, a little anxious, wants to fly again. Um, the Air Force is obligated to take him back into their ranks at a rank comparable to his peers, no loss of duty time. That's per his contract. But the Air Force, I believe, is a little squeamish. If we hire you back, we will be accused of employing spies. The Air Force does not want that reputa reputation. The CIA has no use for him. He can no longer be a CIA pilot. He's too well known. So Kelly Johnson comes to the rescue. 
Kelly Johnson, the designer of the airplane, works out of Lockheed Aircraft Corporation Skunk Works. Um, he offers Dad a job as a Lockheed test pilot as long as he can pass the mental and physical examinations. Dad passes with flying colors. No ill effects from his incarceration. He signs on with Lockheed. He's a Lockheed test pilot between 1963 and 1970. In 1970, this is one of the photos that was taken for my father's book. I'm a little five-year-old kid, my sister in the background, mom and dad on either side. The book is published in 1970. It talks about his experiences. Um, at that time, he is let go from Lockheed. He's fired. My father did not think it was coincidence. He thought because he wrote his book, he ruffled somebody's feathers in the government, the government contractor beholden to the government for contracts, obligated or asked to let him go. There's no official proof I found to confirm that. But what I did find in FOIA requests in 2017 is that after dad was fired, he hires an attorney. The attorney writes letters back and forth to the Air Force and the CIA. They negotiate a financial compensation package in lieu of an Air Force retirement. Dad signs the non-disclosure agreement, goes on the lecture circuit, promotes his book for the next two years, international uh, audiences talking about his experiences. In 1972, he gets a job with KGIL radio station in the San Fernando Valley, flying fixed wing Cessnas, reporting on news, weather, and traffic for the rush hour commutes. Then in 1976, gets a job with NBC television, flying their helicopter, reporting on news, weather, and traffic, this time for the evening news. He's in doing those assignments for about a year and a half, two years, until August 1st, 1977. He's coming back from Santa Barbara, California. His helicopter runs out of gas and crashes. He and the cameraman are killed in the accident. He's buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, President Jimmy Carter signed a presidential decree to get him in there. He was issued the Distinguished Flying Cross um, uh, prior to being shot down, all the U-2 pilots wore, which is one of the reasons he was eligible for uh, burial at Arlington. Um, where was I going to go with that? So once he is, um, uh, so uh, he's buried at Arlington. So what I've talked about today is the U-2 incident, the misinformation, the truth of what took place, the research I've done. The research led me to write three books. The first one came out in 2017, self-published, Letters from a Soviet Prison, the personal journal, the correspondence of my father back and forth to his family, his thoughts, his feelings, his hopes, his despairs, what it's like to be inside of a Soviet prison during the middle of the Cold War, primary source document. I thought it was very important for the public record, the historical record, to have his thoughts and feelings uh, in writing, what he talked about, what he wrote about in the Soviet prison, so that historians, scholars, students in the future could read his words as he wrote them. My second book came out in 2019, basically the story I told you tonight, Spy Pilot. 30 years of research, five years to write it, sets the record straight, takes dad's reputation from infamy and controversy in the 60s to an American hero today. It goes through the behind the scenes process as to how he was ultimately awarded the POW medal in 2000 and the silver star in 2012. So this is a definitive account of what he went through based on unpublished memoirs, unpublished records, FOIA requests, interviews with family, friends, his associates that he flew with back in the military and in the CIA. This came out in 2019. The photo behind me um, is the awards ceremony when General Schwartz, the head Air Force General at the time in 2012, is presenting the Powers family with Dad's Silver Star. This is my son, Gary Powers III, who's accepting the medal on behalf of the family. And this here is the image of the Silver Star and the certificate that goes with it. He was, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, he was uh, issued, he was awarded the POW medal in 2000. Uh, that all came about because of the following. 1998, there was a declassification conference hosted by the CIA and the Air Force at Fort Leslie J. McNair in Washington, D.C. At this conference, two very important things were declassified. Uh, first, the program, 1954 to 1974, including the U-2 incident. One of the things declassified is that the plane was shot down at 70,500 feet. There was no flame out, no descent, no sabotage. It was a missile that 
exploded behind the tail section. In the 60s, the American government didn't want to say that. Our missiles didn't go that high. Our radars didn't pick up the plane. We could not be behind the Soviets in technology. It was easier to blame the pilot than publicly admit we were behind the Soviets in technology. But once uh, you know, enough time passes, the Cold War is over, it's 1998, they're able to declassify this stuff and the truth is finally revealed. The second thing that was uh, 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 revealed is that it was a military operation. In the 60s and the 50s, it was a civilian operation headed by the CIA, a civilian agency. It had to be civilian at the time. A military plane with a military pilot flying over a foreign hostile country is an act of war. Eisenhower did not want to provoke World War III. He wanted to gather intelligence, hence why it was a civilian operation at the time. But now, declassified documents, CIA working hand in hand with the US Air Force could not be separated. For all intent and purposes, it's a military operation that was finally declassified. Once that word military was declassified, that allowed the government to step up to the plate, honor dad as a hero to our country, award him a military decoration because civilians are not entitled to military decorations. So it was, took a declassification conference in 98 to help get everything sorted out. Um, and that type of information is also included in my book. So the final thing I want to do before I open up for Q&A is go over uh, a couple of websites. Uh, first off will be this one. National Security Archives, part of George Washington University. If you type in Google NSAGW Secret U2, this is the first page that pops up. And at the bottom of the page, you can get the links to the declassification documents from 1998. You will see here the final overflights of the Soviet Union, operations after May of 60. That's where that really good information is that I found about the military operation and the altitude of the plane and things like that. So this is where you can go and read that declassified file. If you'd like to reach me, I can be reached at my website, GaryPowers.com. Um, as part of GaryPowers.com, I do lectures, I write books, I speak internationally, I love getting in front of school groups, um, as well as libraries, retirement facilities, and other groups that need speakers. If you know of any, please let me know. I'm always looking for lecture venues. I also run, out of Washington, D.C., Spy Tours of Washington. If this group here would like to do a spy tour, fundraiser for the college or some other community group, pick you up here, charter a bus into D.C. Pro how long is it here? Two hours, four hours to D.C.? Four hours, two hours? Three hours. So we could do it in a day. It'd be a really long day. I'd probably want to do an overnight trip but we take you by uh, drop points, safe houses, clandestine locations where spies are caught, captured, or killed, have briefings on Civil War espionage, World War II, Cold War espionage up till modern time. So we'll go by Aldrich Ames' home, Alger Hess's home, Wild Bill Donovan's home, CIA headquarters, FBI headquarters, drop points and safe houses that have been declassified. So more information online at GaryPowers.com and SpyTour.com. And the last thing, I just started that this year, is Cold War Espionage Tours of Europe. My first one in March of this year went to um, Germany and the Czech Republic. Drop points, safe houses, clandestine locations. But here we saw the KGB uh, underground nuclear storage facility in the Czech Republic. We saw the Stasi headquarters in Berlin. We st saw the Stasi headquarters in Leipzig and different museums, Cold War museums, spy museums in and around these cities in the Czech Republic and Ber in Germany. This tour will take place next year, April, the last two weeks, April 14th through April 25th. We'll be going to Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. The cities we visit will go to bunkers, fallout shelters, Cold War spy-related museums, drop points, safe houses, etc. So we'll see a lot of great things. I already have 15 people signed up. I need another 10 by uh, December 30th to make it a go, and I'm sure I'm going to reach that minimum. So if you're interested, please see me afterwards. I've got flyers up here, and of course, more information online at GaryPowers.com. The last thing I want to show maybe two things. I mentioned the Cold War Museum at first. The Cold War Museum, you can find out more information online at coldwar.org. 
And for anybody who has kids in school or grandchildren in school, at the bottom of this page, under Cold War Stories and Related Tales, there is a section with hundreds, if not thousands, of first-hand accounts given to us by the soldiers, the military personnel who were in the air, on the water, in the submarines, fighting the Cold War from 45 to 91. So this is a great resource of primary source documents and stories for students to do research on. And then finally, if you go and Google Gary Powers U2 wreckage, you can find images of the wreckage. His flight suit is helmet on display in Gorky Park. Uh, this one here of Khrushchev looking uh, at the wreckage with the tail section in the back. Uh, and then other images of the uh, wreckage, uh, my father or myself, uh, in regards to um, uh, the layout at the time. So here we've got uh, at the bottom, um, where does it go? Okay, uh, this is it. So this is part of the film and the camera system of the U-2 that was on display in Gorky Park. So these are the type of images that you can find if you do that Google search. So thank you all very much for coming out. I think that is approximately one hour. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rich, uh, Garrett College, uh, everybody with the AV department and the marketing department who helped with this, and the audience for coming out and spending an hour with me to learn about Cold War history and my father. I'd love to open this up now for Q&A until I get the cane. So thank you all very much. Thank you.